Hey there, nice to see you. Good evening. Welcome to the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nets program where we talk to reporters, writers, editors, journalists, all different people who are putting stuff out so you can find out what they're thinking about when they um, write their uh, news stories. And in our first segment, we're going to talk housing um, with a uh, city limits reporter. In our second segment, we put talk to people who put other stuff out. And in this case, it's a jazz duo who's uh, playing regularly in a Bronx restaurant. And we'll talk about that. But uh, right now, let's talk to the senior housing reporter from City Limits. It is uh, Emma Whitford. Nice to see you, Emma. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Just a little background. Now, you had said you started with City Limits um, just a couple of months ago. Um, a little bit just so people can know who you are. What What is your background? How, how did you get into this nasty journalism business? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I started at City Limits in February. Uh, prior to that, I had been working at a legal trade publication called Law 360, uh, where I covered real estate. And I happened to be there spanning the coronavirus pandemic. Um, which was a really troubling but fascinating time to be reporting on the city's housing courts. Um, so starting to cover court closures and executive orders pertaining to evictions uh, really brought me back to my love of covering housing that goes back to uh, an earlier gig I had working at Gothamist um, prior to its merger with WNYC back in 2014, 2015, 2016. So. Wow. Uh, and just one last question before we get into the nuts and bolts of this. Um, why, yeah. do you, why, why do you do this? Well, you said, you know, your love for covering housing. What, what made you say, hey, I think I'm going to do this? I mean, to me, it's just endlessly fascinating. Um, I like fine print. I like wonky stuff. I like interpreting orders and court decisions. But housing really comes back to the people behind the stories, renters. In this job, also, I'm reporting more on people who are unhoused and trying to get apartments. And it feels like such a fundamental part of being a New Yorker is understanding our crazy housing market. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and why, why, as uh, that uh, former uh, presidential candidate said, why the rent is too damn high. That is, a, <laughs> that is a very good start for what we're talking about. Anyway, let's just um, get right into it. The most recent thing that you've written, um, the title is Advocates Blast New Work Requirement Tucked into the Mayor's Housing Voucher Rule. This is a national issue because uh, obviously it was de hotly debated during uh, you know, the last uh, negotiations for the debt limit with the president, um, the, the fact that many people believe people getting benefits should like prove some work requirement. Um, tell us a little bit about what's going on now with the mayor and the city of New York. Yeah, so this is a really interesting one. Um, uh, so on this past Friday, the mayor held a press conference and he signed what's called an emergency rule. And the Headline ver the headline of that rule is he decided to do away with this um, previously existing uh, rule to access a city voucher called the 90 day rule. I keep saying rule over and over, but <laughs> with That's the 90 day right. rule, <laughs> um, basically what it used to mean is that if you were an unhoused person living in shelter and you wanted to access a rental voucher funded by the city, um, then you would have to be in the shelter system for at least 90 days or three months before you could access that voucher. Mm -hmm. so this has been something that advocates have been calling for the elimination of for a long time. They say, look, you, it's already... Oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're basically asking somebody to live in bad conditions or more difficult conditions for 90 days before they can get out of it. It's kind of, I, I can understand why they say, well, if the voucher is available, let's just do it. <laughs> right. So uh, the mayor held a press conference and he said, we're going to get rid of the 90 day rule. And this was exciting for advocates. But the catch here is that at the very same time, in late last month, the city council passed four bills um, that would add additional reforms and changes to make these same city FEPS vouchers more accessible to more people. Things like increasing the uh, income threshold under which you can qualify, making it easier for people to get vouchers before they get to shelter in the first place. And another aspect of what these city council bills would do is get rid of a uh, so-called work requirement. Um, so under currently, you know, families with children and also single adults and adult only households 
basically you have to work a certain amount. This has always been the case in order to access these vouchers. Now, in the fine print of this uh, emergency rule that the mayor signed on Friday, it didn't come up during the press conference. But what he did is first he slipped he said, it in there. He slipped <laughs> it in, huh? Yeah. So uh -huh. uh, prior to last week, if you were a uh, a family with children, you were supposed to work 14 hours a week in order to qualify for a voucher. Now, he did reduce that slightly in this order. He said, OK, families with children, instead of 14, you're going to work 10 hours a week, which was, you know, advocates would say a step in the right direction. But then for adult only households, previously, the rule had been any number of hours of, that you work a week, you're going to be able to qualify for a voucher. So he took that and he raised it up to 10. So now both mm -hmm. categories, all categories across the system have to work 10 hours a week. But for advocates, they were like, wait a minute, you know, here we are. Sure, you're going to reduce it a little bit for families with children. But what about all these other adults in the system, tens of thousands of them who yep. now have like somewhat more of a barrier? It's, um, it's a it's a real it's a real catch 22 because and I understand the philosophical thing. You're saying, well, you've got to be working and, you know, you should earn your keep, so to speak. And the city will, you know, needs need you to be productive. On the other hand, if these people were working and making a living, they might not be in the shelter system to begin with. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it, it's a it's a real catch 22 kind of balance here. So you describing this as a catch-22, I think that's something I've been hearing from members of the city council. I talked to Purina Sanchez, who's actually a council member from the Bronx. She sponsors the bill that would eliminate the work requirement. And she said, here are people who, you know, probably lost work. And then that's how they ended up in shelter. And then you're stuck in this difficult situation between a rock and a hard place where you're not only looking for housing, you're looking yeah. for a job and just everything's compounding. Yeah, so uh, we're at this interesting juncture right now where basically uh, the mayor passed his emergency rule on Friday, but this coming weekend will be one month since the city council passed its broader reform package. And there's been a big question, you know, as recently as Friday, the mayor was critical of the larger package. He wouldn't say if he plans to veto it or not, but that's definitely a possibility on the table. We'll see. And if he... Oh, yeah, just to add quickly, if he doesn't take an action, um, uh, either sign or veto, these bills will just lapse into law after 30 days. Well, so we'll, we'll see what happens. So we'll, we'll see. And we'll, we will read city limits and check what Emma <laughs> Whitford is writing about. And then we'll find out exactly what's going on. I wanted to ask you when you wrote about this, um, this city's chief housing officer um, left. Uh, we do know that the police commissioner left. Are, are these the kinds of things that we just talked about that frustrate uh, some of the people working in, in, you know, for the mayor in these things. Do you have a sense of why she left? Is it the same kind of thing? I mean, there's a lot of rumors about the police commissioner. Um, what are your thoughts on Jessica Katz uh, leaving uh, her post as chief housing officer? Yeah, so I will say uh, just a slight adjustment on that. She has not left yet. She's planning to leave in July, but That's she true. told actually Fair my enough. <laughs> My predecessor in this role, David Brand, shout out, he's at Gothamist now. Um, he had an exclusive interview with her where she was saying, you know, more or less, she felt like she's accomplished some things and now is her time and she's going to move on. Um, you know, I talked to both advocates. And no, notice my eyebrows raised when you said that. <laughs> so there are a few things that came up in my conversations with advocates. Just to take a step back, when Adams took office, there were a lot of... Um, unhoused New Yorkers and their allies who told the administration, one thing we would love to see is if there were an administrative, an administration official who had some purview over both housing related agencies and then the agencies that deal with public benefits and housing to sort of marry these two challenges of like addressing our housing needs and then helping unhoused New Yorkers get an apartment in a more cohesive way. Um, the administration did not ultimately do that, but a lot of advocates mm. said that Jessica Katz was kind of the next best thing to that. Even though she didn't have DSS and HRA under her purview, people said she really had a mind for um, problem solving at this juncture where you have people who desperately need things like vouchers. You know, she would get on the phone and help connect people and was kind of a problem solver in that way. Um, very much focused on uh, the homeless and their need to get into existing apartments. 
Um, whereas on the other hand, you have Maria Torres Springer, who's going to be stepping in right. as um, with this larger umbrella that's like economic and workforce development and housing. And when you hear her talking in public, she does talk about homelessness, but she's also really driving this point of needing to build more housing, increase supply, um, which is definitely another piece of the puzzle. But I think advocates look at this and they're like, here was this person who, you know, kind of understood our plight and our priorities for right. homeless New Yorkers, right. and now she's out. Um, so, so that is a, a difficult thing. One thing I just want to throw in, we got a, a, maybe about a minute left, um, uh, just about the migrant crisis. Uh, is this yeah. seen as part of a housing thing, or is it seen by the city as a separate issue because we're just going to, you know, figure out how to put them in hotels or school gyms. I don't want to pr presume anything. Um, but where, where is that at? And is it possible for the city to ever get their arms around it? Yeah, I think uh, the refrain that you hear over and over again is nothing is off the table. It seems like the administration is very much in, uh, you know, emergency crisis mode these days, really focusing on those short term housing options, things like hotels, um, you've probably seen reporting about, uh, you know, some migrants who've come to New York City being given the option to go up the Hudson Valley or further up towards Albany um, to stay instead. Um, but increasingly, I've been noticing the mayor talking about this possibility of maybe pairing private landlords um, uh, as a housing option. You see, uh, you know, some critics of the administration, like Council Member Lincoln Ressler, saying. We've got these empty NYCHA apartments. We've got these empty um, supportive housing units. How can those get put to the test? So yeah, you know, I'm I'm torn between saying, well, there you go, and then also, why can't people who are looking for you know people in shelters get those same? Like, if we have those same apartments, uh, you know, you know what I mean? It's just uh, I, I'm, on one hand, I see it as a different issue. On the other hand, it looks like the same issue to me. Yeah. You know, so. I, what Connection there is that if people can move out of shelter, out of the standard shelter into housing, that does free up more room for migrants who might be in a DSS shelter um, rather than one of these emergency, more temporary locations. So it's definitely right. like a massive challenge that the city's working could, on. Could you, um, you know, I love when I have a reporter on here and I can just say, so what are you working on next? What's what's like, like, like what, are, what are you working on today or what's coming up? What can we look for from you in city limits? Yeah, so a huge story that comes to a head every year, every June, and happens to be coming ahead tomorrow is the final Rent Guidelines Board vote happening oh. up at Hunter College. So um, last oh. month we got a sense. I, I, I took a deep breath because that's a big one, especially yes. with what they've been suggesting, that it's it's going to be you know huge. I mean, the, the, the potential yeah, increase so is going to be large. Yeah, we're looking at probably the second year in a row that we've had increases on par with um, back to sort of the Bloomberg administration. Right. Um, it's very different from during de Blasio, uh, tenants saw some of their first rent increases in rent stable, uh, sorry, rent freezes in rent stabilized mm -hmm. housing. Um, so we're probably looking like for something on par with last year, which, you know, which for is tenants, how much? Um, could be somewhere between like two and 5% on a one wow. year. Um, yeah. So uh, we'll see what happens at the vote. Anyway, we do got to run Emma Whitford from um, the senior housing reporter from city limits. Thank you for everything you do. Housing is a big issue and we appreciate your time in the Bronx bus. Thank you so much. It's been great. Great. Okay. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, uh, we'll switch gears a little bit and do a little jazz music in the Bronx. Don't go away. STEM is everywhere, like here, behind the scenes of The Walking Dead. When we break down clothes, we tumble it with trisodium phosphate, rock salt, and dish detergent. We stitched together images of our model and created a 3D set that can be walked through in a VR headset. We're able to turn 12 walkers into a thousand walker board. STEM can create new worlds on and off the screen. What will you make with STEM? Get inspired at shecanstem.com. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. 
like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. We appreciate Emma's uh, input. I was just thinking maybe we're going from the ridiculous with the New York housing situation to the sublime and talk to um, two uh, great jazz musicians who play in the Bronx. It is George Nazos and Tamuz Nisim. Nice to see you both. Hi. Hi. Nice to be here. Hi. Nice to have you. Thank you so much um, for playing music in the Bronx. Um, just, um, let, George, let's just start with you. Talk to me about um, your um, how you learned to play. You're a wonderful guitarist. Um, talk to me about your interest in music and how you got where you are today. Uh, I grew up in Greece, and uh, in my generation, uh, I had no exposure to jazz at all. So I was uh, mostly listening to heavy metal, uh, and then I went to progressive rock and progressive metal, and then eventually I heard uh, Jazz Cusion, uh, the Tsik Korea records, the Mahavishnu Orchestra, and from then... I said, really, this is what I would love to do. I always like to improvise, even when I uh, was playing uh, rock. I would find mm -hmm. myself getting lost with the guitar, just uh, so, jamming, basically. So sounds to me over time, um, sounds to me like you mellowed out a little bit. You know, you yeah, kind of said, I, yeah still, you I still have a thing. You grew I mean, up I play, a little bit. Yeah, I still play, I, I mostly play uh, nylon string today, but uh, mm -hmm. still when I have uh, the chance to rock out and play... Uh, some more uh, jazz rock oriented music. I still do that. Um, Tammuz, you are a, a wonderful singer. Talk Thank to me you. about your background in singing when you started. And did you start singing heavy metal before you got to do this kind of music? <laughs> you think? No, uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. No, no. I uh, So I grew up in Tel Aviv and I went um, to an arts high school over there and I actually started as a painter. Oh, how interesting. Completely, but I come from an artistic family. These are my grandmother's artwork. I can tilt the camera a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, so I was um, playing the piano and, and painting, and I always liked singing. And uh, my school had a music department, a jazz music department. And this was in, and, tel in Israel? Yeah, in Tel Aviv. Wow, how interesting. And, uh, and I joined um, the jazz music department. I started singing. I fell in love with it. And uh, I used to have um, a local, local gig every um, Tuesday in Tel Aviv in a cafe when I was maybe 15. And uh, every Wednesday, I would take the little money I made and I'd go to the CD store and I'd buy all the records I could afford and I'd learn all the songs on the record. L learned all the songs on the, on, you learned all the songs on the piano and sang? Yeah, yeah, I used wow. to have a band. I, I always liked playing with guitar players, um, be, maybe because I also play piano myself, but also because I really, I really like guitar. Um, so, all right, so now we're going to get personal. So now you're married. <laughs> um, did, did you meet here in the States? And did you meet because of music? Or did we, you meet and then you said, oh, by the way, I play music? <laughs> uh, we, we, we met in a music school. We, we both uh -huh. studied in a conservatory in the Netherlands, uh, in Rotterdam. Later, I changed school and I moved to The Hague. But we both uh, were college students, right, studying yes. music. And yes, and yes. and um, at what point did you say, hey, maybe we ought to make like a little duo and and sing and play together? And that was that when you came here to to the states. Oh, we've been. You want to say? Uh, we performed already in the Netherlands while we were students, and then um, uh, it made sense to to play together. I mean, we enjoyed it first of all, right. and yeah. for me, it was a real uh, uh, eye opener to play duet uh, as a vocalist. I mean, there, there are not a lot of people that made a career uh, doing that. A Accompanying mm -hmm. a vocalist as a guitar player is one of the most difficult things, but I took the talent, uh, enjoyed it. Right, there you go. Uh, and, and, and now listen, um, what, what these folks do, um, they play every Sunday from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Bronx Burger House, which is on Marshall Avenue uh, in... Um, I guess right off Broadway. I've been there a hundred yeah. times, the best burger place in the Bronx, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and um, that that must be nice because you it's it's very close to people. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't exactly. know wh which one of you wants to just talk about those gigs and and the playing of them together. Go ahead. 
Go ahead. Sense. Sure. Go ahead, Tammy. Uh, so, Don't be shy. Um, we collaborated. Um, we are collaborating uh, for for the Bronx Burger House that we play every Sunday. First of all, um, is more than just our concert. It's a it's a concert series. Um, it happens every week from six to nine every Sunday, and from six to seven we have a special guest. So it's the two of us plus one. Uh, I double on on drums and sometimes piano. Depends who's the guest. So if the guest on on drums, I'm gonna play I, piano. I think we, we we may have some pictures of some of that. So if they want right. to uh, show a little bit, there you go. Sure. Um, and and so and that's from six to seven p.m. The six to seven is the show, and then from seven to nine is the jam session. And those are the pictures you see: different musicians, different instruments. Those are uh, all professional musicians who live around here. Um, most of them, Tammy, the singer over here, she's in Brooklyn, but she came mm -hmm. by because. Well, she's nice. forgiven. That's okay. We accept yeah. that. But you know, it's it's kind of a, a little. It's kind of a. There you are on the drums. It's kind yeah. of a cozy um a place and a cozy place to play all, nice. all that music. Yeah, it's a very welcoming place. It has turned into. Uh, it's the third month we are doing. We managed to have uh, already Not thirteen third, fifth. fifth month. We yeah. have thirty fifth musicians. Month. Thirty wow. musicians have worked there. And we yep. have to say that this happened not only because of uh, Laura, that she's the, Laura, the manager, who then founded she's Four the, Bronx. That's her, her yes, organization. But also, yes. we had the, the support of the one of the most important uh, nonprofit uh, jazz organizations uh, in the city. It's called Kid Up, mm -hmm. and they have been also giving us uh, uh, sponsoring the the concert, so we are able to get paid without uh, playing in a place that doesn't charge for uh, cover okay. music. Right. Basically Which means every that, that that's just a that's just a wonderful thing. So we have a little clip of you, so people okay. could see what you sound like, and um, it happens to be one of my favorite songs, one of everybody's okay. favorite songs. I'm but sorry, it's beautifully done. About... We'll, we'll just show a little piece of it. So right. uh, Anderson, if you can uh, cue up the jukebox, uh, let's see what happens. Little darling, it's been a long, cold, lonely winter. Darling, it feels like years since it's been here. Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. All right, there you go. Anyway, so people could Thank get to you. see, but it's intimate and it's beautiful. Um, just talk about um the the audience and the and the vibe in that house. Um, because look, people are eating burgers. <laughs> they are in beer. burgers, they're drinking but, sometimes, but, but, they but, are in conversations. But I have to say that there were some moments of listening. Uh, we had a night uh, for the pre award winners' night, and there was oh, saxophone yes. solo, and there were ladies on the bar. I think it was a woman about my age and her mother, elderly woman, and they looked at each other and they said, This is so beautiful. They looked at me, they looked at each other, this is so beautiful. They looked at me again and they said it like five or seven times. And it's this, yeah, this that, little that magic. Is beautiful. That, that is, yeah, that is it, you know, beautiful. And, it's and it's and something it's, uh, that the neighborhood really needed uh, yeah. to have. Uh, at this point, it's uh, the only weekly uh, jazz uh, uh, series in the and Bronx. Jump and jam session. Yeah, I'd, no. I'd like to, you know, there are a lot of places in the Bronx. You know, this is something we had this discussion on our last program uh, about the importance of, um, uh, you know, these kinds of things in the Bronx. Every neighborhood should have this. I mean, that's that's yes. the way I look at it. And and what you guys have and what we've just showed, there is so much music in the Bronx. There's so, a wide range. There's so musicians, musicians everywhere. Yeah. And musicians that perform, you know, perform around Manhattan, perform around the borders, perform around the, the world. world perform around the states um, yeah, well, we, want, we want we want to perform producing. here and also i think there's more restaurants that could do just this kind of thing it would bring more people in i, I mean i'm a, a big advocate of these yeah. kinds of things i'm always curious about a muse you know that so that song here comes the sun obviously one of the great pop songs of all time mm -hmm. rock, rock, rock songs we have a small story that we need to mention for that uh, while playing a concert in a, the island of antiparos in greece we yes. played uh, our version, and without knowing, uh, Olivia Harrison was in the the audience. Yeah. Are you so, kidding? Or the owner of the restaurant, he came and he whispered and he told him, mm -hmm. uh, "George Harrison's widow is here, and she's uh, touched the tears." Did you? Did you really? Did she talk to you? Of yeah, course. yeah. We sat. We sat with her. It was. My heart just skipped a beat. That is so beautiful. Yeah, and that was just purely coincidental. 
Total Completely. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Um, so, but that leads into what my question is: how do, how do you choose what music? I mean, you know, here comes the sun is not traditional jazz. Um, right. but, um, so do, you know, how do you choose music? Like, well, does one of you can, say, Hey, let's do this. And the other one says, well, let's do this. You know, how does it, well, we it also work? write our, a lot of our own music. I always won a composition award, uh, last year from the Bronx Council oh. of the Arts. Uh, but I, I like to do both original music and cover music. Don't forget that the jazz standards or the American songbook were pop songs of, of the time. And, and the musician, like, for example, someday my prince will come was, was from a Disney movie from uh, Sleeping mm. Beauty. And it became one of the most famous uh, jazz standards. So um, any do, song do you, you treat it the right way could, could be done in a jazz way. Do you spend um, a lot of time looking for music or do you, do you, do you rehearse a lot? In other words, you, you have the convenience with other people have a band. They got to call the band members and everything else. You right. guys are right. You wake up in the morning and say, Hey, let's play. So I'm, I'm like, like how often do you play together? How often do you, do you formally rehearse or is it always? Kind uh, of, we can uh, be playing uh, together for uh, 14 years now. Yeah. And uh, that's also, sadly, it's not very common for jazz now to have, mm. because we the uh, same band. a lot of the concerts that we do, we get uh, hired individually and we play with people that it's possible that we have never uh, met before. And it mm. can be also beautiful, but playing with somebody for so long, uh, you don't need to rehab. To rehearse anymore oh that's yeah. fair well we do we do rehearse new material and <laughs> yes. stuff like that but you know the, the beauty of jazz um like for example my previous album was called capturing clouds and it was talking about uh the subject that that there is a moment in time that something happens with the music and it cannot be caught because by the time you try to picture a cloud or draw the cloud it's gone capture the moment of music oh, it's beautiful. really changed that's beautiful so let's just uh, wrap it up so every sunday from 6 to 9 p.m the Bronx right. Burger House, you can have a fun little meal. It's great for the family. Uh, it's True. great yeah. for Sunday night. And then you get to see um, all different kinds of music. And you get to see George Nazos and Tammuz Nisim perform. And a few mentions. Uh, if, yes, if please. May, um, on July 9, we're going to do a sidewalk jazz cafe. So the whole of Marshall Street on Marshall the side Avenue. of the Burger oh. House is um, going to be uh, music outdoors. And, and um, what day, the July 9th, what day of the week is uh, it? It is a Sunday, but it's going to be earlier than our usual show. I think we are playing from 2 to, two to 5, well, yes. Listen, this this to me is so important in the Bronx. I mean, there's so many issues, but these to me, this right. is how we solve it. We get together, we play music, we enjoy our cultures, exactly. yeah. and I mean, that's it. Listen, you guys are great. George Nazos, Tamuz Nisim, I'm thrilled Thank that we've you. had this moment Thank together. You so much. And I will come out there. I happen to like the Cowboy Burger. That's what I get <laughs> when I go there. But maybe I'll get something different the next time I'll be out there. Okay. Anyway, it'll be a Sunday night, and I hope to see you there. Thank you so much. The Bronx Burger House. Thank Let's you. see George and Tammuz every Sunday night at uh, 6 o'clock. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great. Well, that will do it for the Bronx Buzz. Thanks to Emma from City Limits. Thanks to these guys. And, of course, Laura from the Bronx Burger House. And you know what happens. We'll see you next week. Good night. Good night.